At the end of May 1928, the Caucasian Tartars, or Caucasian Turks, inhabiting the eastern regions of Transcaucasia proclaimed a state, naming it Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is the phonetically transformed name of Atropatin, which used to be part of media and the Iranian world, and never extended north of river Araxis. Atropatin is first mentioned by classical authors, such as uh, Strabo, Pliny the Elder, uh, Ptolemy, for example, amongst others, and a number of other uh, classical sources. What's very consistent is that Atropatin is basically defined as that region that is south of the Araxes River, what is now modern-day Azerbaijan and Iran. There is no such thing as uh, an entity known as Azerbaijan north of the Araxes River, north of it, the province of Iranian Azerbaijan. Historically, no such entity has ever existed, and as we'll see later, it only began uh, in late May of 1918 when such an entity was created mostly in, in a political aspect. Even Abbas Kuli Agabaki Khanov, the father of Azerbaijani historiography, who worked in the first half of the 19th century, does not call the territories north of River Araxes Azerbaijan. Contemporary Azerbaijani historiography falsifies, among other things, the works of its founder. Baki Khanov, the father of their historiography, authored The History of Dagestan and Shirvan, whereas in modern day, Azerbaijani translation this work was called The History of Azerbaijan. These are two completely different titles. That's how the father of their historiography calls their land. He talks at great length about Armenia and Atropatin, while in today's Azerbaijani translation, these names are omitted. The territory north of Araxis is never called Azerbaijan, but Jervan and Dagestan. Here is what General Anton Denikin, the AI supreme ruler of Russia during the Civil War, wrote in his memoirs. Everything in the Republic of Azerbaijan was artificial, fake, beginning with the name taken from one of the Persian provinces. Its synthetic territory included the Lesgi Zakatala, the Armenian Tartar Baku, and Elizabeth Pole provinces, and the Russian Mukhan, bound together by the Turkish policy as the rampart of Pan-Turkism in the Caucasus, an artificial statehood. The way they name themselves is even more ludicrous, Azerbaijani. Before 1936, they were called Caucasian Tartars, or Caucasian Turks. This is exactly how they were referred to in the USSR census of 1926. Only in 1936, on the eve of enacting the USSR constitution, Stalin decreed to officially rename the Turkic language of Azerbaijan into the Azerbaijani language, and the Turks of Azerbaijan into the Azerbaijani. That is how it was. The nation called itself a name stolen from neighboring Iran upon Stalin's decree. By calling the eastern part of Transcaucasia Azerbaijan, the pan-Turkic ideologists pursued a far-reaching objective to proclaim it Northern Azerbaijan and subsequently create, on its basis and that of Iranian Azerbaijan, a single Turkic state. Today, steps in this direction have galvanized, and it is not incidental that a state founded on illicit grounds is nurturing equally illicit aspirations over its neighboring countries, whose peoples are indigenous and whose histories date back millennia. Yerevan celebrated its 2,750th anniversary in 1968, setting off a tradition. Every year in the month of October, Armenians celebrate the day of their capital. With an aspiration to falsify the history of Yerevan, an event was organized in Baku in 2011, in which the president of Azerbaijan, Ilham Aliyev, participated himself. It was called the 500 Years 
of the fortress of Yerevan. Azerbaijanis allege that Yerevan was founded in the beginning of the 16th century by Revan Guli Khan, from whom the city's name therefore originated. One has to be half-witted to make such a claim, since Yerevan and its fortress have been mentioned dozens of times before the advent of the 16th century. As early as in the 7th century, Yerevan withstood the Arabs, remaining impregnable. In 1387, it fought Tamerlane when 500 of its citizens fell. Then again, how could it possibly be founded in the early 16th century and be named after Ravan Guli Khan when two centuries before that, in the first half of the 14th century, Mongol rulers Abu Said and Anurshivan had minted coins in the city of Yerevan with its name on them. Falsification as Azerbaijani public policy does not limit itself with forging the history of the capital Yerevan. It extends over all of Armenia and its people. As early as in 1990s, the preceding president of Azerbaijan, Haydar Aliyev, the progenitor of incumbent Ilham Aliyev, instructed Azerbaijani historians to falsify and restate the history of the region to the benefit of Azerbaijan. Falsification in Azerbaijan has become a state-imposed duty. Already during the Soviet period, there existed a good school in Azerbaijan, but unfortunately, it is now mostly suppressed. Those who at least say something, who dare to speak up, get persecuted. Persecuted by people who are appointed through political motivation and are rather detached from science. This is the unfortunate problem of contemporary Azerbaijani science, the humanities in particular. Arriving at certain conclusions on the basis of objective historical facts, even those conclusions are not in the interest of political authorities, should not become an excuse for persecution. There was a time when science used to be subservient to religion. Politics have come to replace it in our days. As a result of public policy intent on fabrication, not only Armenian lands and cultural monuments were proclaimed Azerbaijani, but also the history and culture of other nations. For example, the Safavid Kingdom of Persia was pronounced an Azerbaijani state while the world-famous medieval Persian poet Nizami and Azerbaijani Turk. As for Nizami, we recently learned that the Persian poems inscribed on his tombstone have been erased. Nizami himself, when once requested to recite a poem in Turkish, responded with the following two beats. A Turk's conduct does not befit us. Turkish speak is not our value. He who is noble shall speak a noble tongue. That is, I am Persian and shall speak in Persian. It belittles me to use the savage language of the Turk. One of the important pillars of Azerbaijani falsification is the statement that Armenians did not inhabit the territory of the current Republic of Armenia before the 15th century. In order to comprehend the absurdity of this, one only needs to cast a glance at the prominent maps of the world drawn and published, incidentally, by non-Armenians. Herodotus, the father of historiography, refers in his works to Armenia and its location, the headwaters of Tigris and Euphrates, the territory north of it, while German and English cartographers, who drew maps of the world according to his data, placed Armenia almost in the center of the world. Eratosthenes, living in the 3rd century BC, his works also contain references to Armenia and maps drawn on the basis of his writings as well as those of other antique scholars, always place Armenia in the center.
պատրաստած գրած գրությունների հիման վրա պատրաստված քարտեզները բոլորը բոլորը գինս կենտրոնում ունեն հայաստանը This list could go on indefinitely browsing through maps by famous antique and medieval authors Thribo Ptolemy 10th century Arab geographer Al Istarkhri Armenia throughout is placed between the Black, Caspian and Mediterranean seas. Where, by the way, is Azerbaijan? Azerbaijan Atropatin is a Medo-Persian region that never extended north of River Araxis. This is corroborated by the information supplied even by Muslim geographers. Islamic maps naturally ascribe more importance to Islamic countries. Among their maps of the Balti school, there is one called Azerbaijan, Albania and Armenia. On this map, the region southeast of Araxes is called Azerbaijan, that is Atropatin, to the northeast, and east of it is Armanistan, which is Armenia, and the region of Kura and Araxes. North of Kura towards Derbend is called Albania, Aran in Arabic. The name Azerbaijan Atropatin is never applied north of Araxes on any Islamic map until the year 1918. با هدف جدا کردن آزربایجان از آزربایجان ایران و بعد در صورت امکان دستندازی با آزربایجان ایران It's common knowledge that the place used to be called Aran, and in all ancient writings, that is how it was called, whereas Azerbaijan was to the south of River Araxes. Even now, old people in Azerbaijan on this side do not call that part Azerbaijan. They say Aran. That place is ingrained in their memories as Aran. سراغ داریم به آذربایجان پایین رو درس بود و حتی در همین زمانه ما هم کوهن سالان آذربایجان این سو هیچ وقت نمیگن اونجا رو آذربایجان میگن آران The Azerbaijani forgers of history expanded the boundaries of the absurd insisting that Armenians have no relation whatsoever to Armenia since they call their country Hayastan themselves Yes, Armenians do call their country Hayastan, though other nations predominantly call it Armenia. Being called different names in various languages is a customary practice. Georgia, for example, is called Sakardvelo in Georgian, but Grusia in Russian, Georgia in English, Rastan in Armenian, Gershistan in Turkish. So claiming that Armenia and Hayastan are different countries would entail considering Georgia, Sakardvelo, Grusia, Rastan, and Gershistan to be five different countries. Or, for that matter, insist that Deutschland in Germany, Germania in Russian, Germany in English, Alaman in French, Tixland in Scandinavian languages, Niemcy in Polish, and Zaksa in Fini, seven different countries, rather than being one and the same Germany. The Turco-Persian Wars, those were raging since early 16th century, devastated Armenia and reduced its population. Leaping at this opportunity, the Azerbaijani fabricators of history attempted to claim that no Armenians lived in this region on the 17th century. The ludicrousness of this claim is made apparent by a neutral source of the period, the famous French traveler Jean Jardin. Passing through Yerevan in 1673, which was then under Persian rule, he made a drawing of the city, entitling it the German publication of his travel memoirs, Erivan, the capital of Armenia, mind you, of no other country.
In order to distort the history of Yerevan, the Azerbaijani falsifiers tried to refer to a medal issued by the Russian Empire for the taking of Yerevan and a battle seen by a Russian painter, Franz Rubo, the taking of the Yerevan fortress on October 1, 1827. Since on both of these, Yerevan is represented by images of mosques, the Azerbaijani falsifiers conclude that Yerevan was an Azerbaijani town. Following this twisted logic, the entire world of Islam should be proclaimed Azerbaijani. Franz Rubo's battle scene was painted in 1893. The artist was born in 1856, 29 years after the taking of the fortress, and he put a Persian mosque in the composition wishing to emphasize the surrender of Persian troops to the Russians. The same is true of the memorial medal for the taking of Yerevan. The purpose of highlighting Persian mosques was to celebrate the passing of Yerevan from Persian rule to Russia. The fact that Yerevan, being the center of eastern Armenia, was also one of the most important cities of Persia is common knowledge. This is attested to by huge quantities of coins minted by various Persian shahs between the 16th to the 19th centuries, bearing the writings Zarbekh Iravan, that is issued in Yerevan. But all of the above pertains to Persia, not in the least to Azerbaijan. Today as well, in the heart of the capital of the first Christian state in the world, rises the Blue Mosque, a superb example of Islamic architecture. And since it is an 18th century Persian monument, the government of the Republic of Armenia has handed it over to be disposed by the embassy of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The same fair treatment applies to another Islamic monument in the vicinity of Yerevan, a Turkoman Karakoyunlu state period tomb, built in 1413, which was transferred to be disposed by the embassy of Turkmenistan. Incidentally, the Turkoman Karakoyunlu state is also announced by Azerbaijani falsifiers to be Azerbaijani. The mosques of Yerevan are a favorite subject of Azerbaijani counterfeiters. According to various sources in the 19th century, there were two large mosques within the perimeter of the Yerevan fortress and six smaller ones nearby. Today, one of the larger mosques is preserved in Yerevan, the Blue Mosque. The rest were brought down during the years of Soviet power. It is common knowledge that the Soviet authorities, with atheism as their banner, for many decades demolished the houses of prayer throughout the territory of the USSR. Numerous Christian Armenian monuments were pulled down in Yerevan through those years. The St. Peter and Paul Church, built in the 5th century, was ruined in the 1930s. The magnificent St. Mary's Cathedral of the 12th and 13th centuries was destroyed in the center of Yerevan. The churches of St. Gregory the Illuminator, Gethsemane, St. Simon, Thessaruni, Malar, the medieval cemetery of Kozern, and many other structures of historical value were demolished. In 1938, Notwithstanding the numerous protests and complaints, the authorities pulled down the surviving fragments of the walls of the fortress of Yerevan, building a wine factory instead. The Russian Nikolayev Church, a majestic 19th century architectural monument, was also destroyed. And the 1913 St. Mary's Russian Orthodox Church in the 1930s was converted to a movie theater. This was the reality of those years. While the Azerbaijani falsifiers ascribing to Armenians the destruction of one large and six small mosques in Yerevan by Soviet authorities, should be asked the following question. Did the same happen in Soviet Azerbaijan? Suffice it to recall the blowing up in 1936 of the famous Bibi Abad Mosque, 
or the destruction in the same year of the magnificent Russian Orthodox Alexandronevsky Cathedral in Baku. Why the pious population of Azerbaijan did not save these monuments from the Soviet power. After all, the Azerbaijani falsifiers should not forget that Following Azerbaijan's independence, they themselves have destroyed mosques in Baku, as well as its environs, something that the Azerbaijani media of the time, the Islamic Council of the Caucasus, and even Muslims in Turkey strongly opposed. This even became a subject of a special discussion in a report by the U.S. Department of State. Who are the indigenous nations living on the territory of present-day Azerbaijan? that may be considered legitimate heirs to historical Caucasian Albania. The Arab sources refer to two distinct races on the territory of Caucasian Albania. One is Albanians per se, and the other was called Lagzania, the Lesgis. Lagzis are the ancestors of contemporary Lesgis. From among the Albanian races, the Udi also have made it to the 20th century. During the years of the Karabakh movement, which originated in the late 1980s, the Azerbaijani authorities considering the Udi to be Armenians expelled them from the territory of the country. They have mostly found refuge in Armenia. Originally, the area was known as Albania, but even according to, say, Strabo, there were 26 or even more languages, perhaps, spoken in the region. So in a sense, you have, broadly speaking, a very diverse Caucasian element. Iranian rule was very strong, so there's an Iranian element to this day. There's a very large, tallish speaking uh, minority. The Armenian element also existed in the western regions uh, uh, of the country. It is not incidental that right at the beginning of the collapse of Soviet tyranny, the Armenians were the first to raise the flag of liberation, proclaiming the independent republic of mountainous Karabakh. During the 1990s, the other indigenous peoples on the territory of Azerbaijan also got on their feet the Talish proclaimed the Talish Mugan Republic, while the Lesgis raised the flag of free Lesgistan. Both of these movements were suppressed with the power of firearms, and their leaders ended up in exile. History, nonetheless, demonstrate that it is impossible to annihilate the freedom-loving spirit of indigenous peoples living on their own land. The Armenian historians, as a rule, do not respond to Azerbaijani falsifiers of history. Some of them simply consider it beyond their dignity to stoop to their level, while others relying on the old saying, a lie has speed, but truth has endurance, leave it to time to set the record straight. <laughs> The Moscow University scholars, having gone through history textbooks of all CIS states, have revealed that only two from among the Commonwealth of Independent States, Armenia and Belarus, have not distorted their own history, the common history of their shared land, we were in it together for almost 200 years, have not misrepresented the history of their neighbors preserving their integrity and that of history. The Azerbaijani falsification is elevated to the level of public policy. The administration spares no effort to disseminate the falsifications it has commissioned all over the world. And what is most abhorrent the falsifications are included in school textbooks. They poison Azerbaijani children at a tender young age. In those textbooks, children are falsely assured that the Christian Armenian monuments on the territory of Azerbaijan were created by their ancestors, purported Christian Azerbaijanis. Whereas the same Azerbaijani authorities, in broad daylight, destroyed, through their army, thousands of Christian Kachkars in Julfa, 
and the other monuments throughout the territory of Azerbaijan. One cannot help but recall and remind Azerbaijani authorities of a well-known quote by Abraham Lincoln. You can fool all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time.